the topics. Um, the first topic is on flood hazards and risks in Metro Cebu. Our speaker has a Master of Science degree in the Institute of Water Education in Delft, the Netherlands. And actually he, he got a, he was um, cum laude when he graduated in his master's degree. So he is currently the chair of the Department of Civil Engineering of the University of San Carlos and was the former assistant dean of the School of Engineering of the University of San Carlos. He has relevant experience in the flood of hydrological engineering and has led various projects. He is a member of the CHED Technical Committee for Civil Engineering and the PRO of PICE Cebu Chapter. Everyone, help me welcome and let's give a virtual applause to Engineer Ricardo Alfarnis. Thank you, Ari, for that uh, introduction. I am now sharing my screen. Is it, uh, can you view it now? Is my screen visible now? Yes, sir. We can now view your screen. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. We have about 240 participants. And I noticed that uh, we have participants from Kuwait and even Australia. <laughs> and, of course, many from the region and also the entire Philippines. So, thank you so much for attending this. So, I hope you can learn something from our presentations. Well, my presentation as titled, it's uh, Flood Hazards and Risk in Metro Cebu, but I intentionally dropped uh, Metro Cebu because like, when we talk about hazards and risk, uh, it's also applicable to any other areas. Okay, for the flow of my presentation, I will start with the basic definition of terms and then the basic principle in estimating the force and the effects of flooding. And the third one is estimating discharge in planning of flood control structures using the DPWH standard. I will mention also, I will show you some uh, sample flood hazard maps. And finally, I'll give an example of the flood control measures for small catchment scale. Okay, hazards and risks. Now as uh, defined, when you look at the definition of a hazard, it is something that can cause damage or harm. And obviously, flood is a hazard, no? based on the definition. A risk, on the other hand, is the chance that any hazard will cause somebody damage or harm. So in risk, we will be talking of probability or the chance. And if you mention a hazard and risk, you cannot disregard vulnerability, which is exposure to hazard, harm, or damage. Now, I'm showing you now a natural catchment where you can see the normal uh, water level. So in here, that's the normal water level. And then if there is flood, so obviously the water level in that river will go up and the amount where it will go up depends on what we call return period of the flood. 
So when you say return period, that is actually the, the number of uh, average year, or the, that's the average number of years by which the, the same magnitude will record. And then we have another flood, this time caused by the longer return period. Well, though the water level has gone very high already, but in the natural catchment, we don't worry about risk. We don't worry about vulnerability because nature can take care of itself. But that, that is not always the case. Man wants progress. And because of that, we utilize land resource. We change the landscape. And as we change the landscape, of course, we consider also the factor of hazard, risk, and vulnerability. And we can have an environment like this now, where you have the normal water level, and the floodplain is now occupied. Okay, this is the floodplain over here. It's already occupied. And we also build flood wall for the shorter return period. And also flood wall for higher return period. Obviously, the occupants of the floodplain is vulnerable to flooding. So if we have that flood, we are already exposed. And of course, that's very uh, risky, so high risk. But the person over here, which is protected, will still have risk, but the category of risk is smaller compared to the one living on the floodplain. Well, of course, the one option is to relocate this occupants of the floodplain, if we can do that. But that is also something that uh, cannot be easily done. So in the event that we cannot transfer, we cannot relocate these occupants, then another thing is to plan a flood control, a warning system, and adaptation. What will happen? In that case, you can manage the risk. Well, I will give this uh, category, I would say hazards associated with flooding, we can categorize them. We have what we call primary hazards. And we are talking here of effects due to direct contact with water. Secondary hazards, disruption of services and activities and health issues. Then tertiary hazards, that's effects due to changes in position of river channels. Now, normally, the tertiary hazards are long-term. No? This one are really the direct effect. I will show you some illustration. Actually, the pictures, you can get this from the internet. Now, this is the result of Typhoon Xinyang in Dumanhog, town of Cebu. You can imagine the force exerted by the flood water. You can hear, see a tackle jeep here. Uh, the water destroyed the steel gates of the house. You can see furniture, your tables. So imagine the amount of force that will cause this debris. You know? Uh, here as well, uh, this is uh, December 17, uh, 2011. Again, you can imagine the amount of force that transported that debris and deposited it there. Now, as engineers, we always estimate these forces. And when we talk of this force exerted by flood water, the basic principle that we can use is the second law of Newton regarding motion. Okay, uh, 
let me have some time to just show you the expression or the formulas so that we can more or less estimate the amount of force carried by or exerted by the fly. According to that law, force is mass times acceleration, where the arrowhead represents a vector quantity, where acceleration, you can also rewrite it in terms of DVDT, where V is the velocity, and you can rewrite the simple expression into FDT, MDV, and integrating both sides, we obtain F delta T, on the other side, M delta D, or final velocity minus initial velocity. And the force is now equal to M over delta T, where M over, over delta T is what we call as the mass flow rate. How do we obtain such mass flow rate? The mass flow rate can be obtained from the basic definition of Q, which is volume over delta T. Volume, that's equivalent to weight over unit weight. And unit weight can be expressed in terms of density and acceleration due to gravity, where weight over G will now become as mass and finally the mass flow rate which is m over delta t becomes rho q and if you plug in that value here then this is now the force exerted more or less no that that will give us an idea of the force exerted by flood water now take note the density here if we took a flood water it's greater than the ordinary density of water because of the so many suspended sediments. The value of Q obviously gets higher as the return period gets longer. Then, of course, with a higher discharge, the velocity will also increase. So, more or less, you have now a mathematical basis of quantifying the force. Of course, uh, you cannot apply this directly because of so, uh, other factors involved. But basically, that's the force of the running water. The effects of floods, again, uh, pictures from the internet. Uh, this is in Cagayan de Oro. By looking at this picture, you can already enumerate some of the effects due to this flood. Well, to put these effects in words, let's try uh, to have the following. Primary effects of flooding, humans coat in high velocity flood water get drowned. High velocity flood water can wash out roads and bridges, houses, furniture, automobiles, etc. Flood water can cause massive erosion, scour riverbanks, and undermine foundation of bridge piers. When the flood level gets higher, flood water may enter houses and establishment and would ruin furniture and damage floors and walls. Flooding on roads can cause damage of automobile engines when these are submerged in flood water. Flood water can damage crops in farmland and drown livestock and pets. Of course, you can add more to this list. For the secondary effects, disruption of water supply. And I would say this is ironic in the sense that during flood event, there are plenty of water. But in fact, there is shortage due to objectionable quality. So turbidity of water increases due to the entry of sediments to the water source possible contamination of water sources requiring additional cost for treatment. When flood subsides, mud, silts, and other sediments get deposited in establishments, roads, and other low-lying areas which require large cost for cleanup. Transportation services get disrupted. You experience congested traffic, 
because of that, uh, there is reduction of productivity and loss of income. Travel time increases and even travel distances because you will be going to another roads detour. In cases where roads and bridges are washed out, huge amount is needed for the reconstruction and for the provision of temporary bridges and roads for later while reconstruction is undertaken and disruption of our daily activities and plans. Okay, for tertiary effects, river changing course may affect land boundaries and local activities related to rivers. Old course become dry, so the effect is if you are depending your water supply in that river and it is dry now, then your water supply is affected. Sediment deposited by flood alter the fertility and productivity of the land. In some cases, favorable. In other cases, unfavorable. Jobs may be lost due to disruption of services, destruction of business, etc. Although, in some other aspect, uh, jobs may be gained in construction industry to rebuild or repair the flood damages. Insurance rates may increase and corruption may result from issues of relief funds. Let me show you Karai Karai. No? I, I happened to visit Karai Karai because of the project there, that's the construction or the design of the Karai Karai bridge. I did the hydrological and hydrologic uh, design together with uh, engineer Auriflo Raya. Now, this is the river, as you can see, and I want you to notice the vast farmland, which is uh, rice paddies. During a typhoon, there was a typhoon in 2017 of December, the water, instead of following the original course, it bypassed no? and it flows now in this direction. As a result of that, you can see sand deposits could now be seen in rice fields. And obviously, you cannot plant rice anymore. So this is the result of uh, Typhoon or Doha. When we estimated the flood, it's about equivalent to 100 year return period. Look at the massive bank erosion. Now what you see in the picture, you can see the scar of the soil erosion caused by flowing water. What you see here, this is actually the levee, but this is the levee of the left bank of the river. The levee supposed to be will protect the soil, but it does not serve its function because the water does not follow the river anymore. No? The right bank levee is on the other side. So the water is flowing in that direction from right to left. And this one is another, uh, it's caving in now. Also effects of flooding. Now let's proceed to estimating design discharge for flood control projects. Okay, the standards that I will be presenting here is uh, from the DPWH. Okay, that is the technical standards and guidelines for planning of flood control structures.
sorry we are experiencing some some technical difficulties and technical um, issues so while we are Well, we are still having some technical issues. Again, we will, um, this free okay. webinar series. Okay, naka, sir? Yes, uh, what happened? <laughs> we, um, nawala ka for a while. Uh, what was the last slide that I presented? Um, on the okay. DV, sir. Uh -huh. um, you can share your screen, sir. Katong. Estimating uh, flood discharge using DPWH. Ah, okay, good. So I think that's that part, no? This one. Okay, it's my screen. I'm not sure that yet, yeah. sir. So move uh, earlier. You're, you're about to start. That's it. One. Okay, good. Uh, that <laughs> okay, so sorry for that. I got disconnected. And uh, again, uh, estimating design discharge for flood control projects. And uh, I will be using the standard of DPWH. So this is the technical standards and guidelines for planning of flood control structures. It's actually in cooperation with Japan International Cooperation Agency or JICA. And they released it in June uh, 2010. Okay, uh, I, I would like to emphasize that the accuracy of discharge estimation depends on the following factors. One is the availability and reliability of data and pertinent information. And when we talk of data, uh, we, we mean rainfall, uh, discharge data, topographic map, land use map, and soil map. Okay, for the methods used, which is actually also hence to the available data, and you cannot use sophisticated method if you don't have data available. So I, I say here that method is also hence on the availability of data. So this is the flow chart of DPWH. If you notice, uh, delineate the catchment area. And I could understand why it's specified here, one is to 50,000. Because the available maps that we have is from Namria and the printed actually one is to 50,000 scale maps. And it is useful because those maps will show the different contour lines. And then set reference point. Are rainfall data available? No. If that's the case, you go to a method known as a specific discharge method, which I will also explain later. The specific discharge method, you can, we continue it here, letter B, we determine the hydrological region. The idea here, the idea here is that the river basins belonging to a hydrolo hydrological region will behave similarly. That's the assumption of hydrological region. DPWH divide Philippines into Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao as separate hydrological regions. Once you have identified the hydrological region, you now select discharge curve, which is also published in the manual. And finally, you can have your design discharge. That is using a specific discharge. So they allow, even without rainfall data, but then we have to use that method. Uh, 
if there's available data, the recommendation is always to use the runoff model method. And what are these runoff model methods? So if we move to letter A, so letter A here, uh, you have to check whether the catchment that you are working is greater than or equal to 20 square kilometers. If that's the case, then you use the runoff model. No? However, if the area is small and there is no design of storage facilities, we can utilize the rational formula, which is a very simple formula. No? It is just equal to CIA. One. So if you will use the rational formula, you have to choose a rainfall station. And in most cases, if you are in Cebu, you will use Pagasa Mactan no? as the source of your rainfall station or as a, a source of your rainfall data. Then from the rainfall stations, you can estimate the value of I. So there you can, you can calculate the average rainfall based on a return period. Then effective, you estimate the effective rainfall by simply multiplying the I by what we call runoff coefficient. That's the value of C. And finally, you have now the CI and A was established earlier. So that is how to obtain the Q using the rational formula. Now let me elaborate on the rational formula. Uh, I will show you an example later. So this is now uh, estimating, uh, uh, before that, uh, I would like to also emphasize uh, if you are going to use modeling, so you have to calculate the average rainfall by return period. You establish the Hayato graph. Usually the what is applied is you arrange the Hayato graph in alternating block, more or less to mimic the pattern of rainfall. Determine the effective rainfall runoff coefficient. Then we have to perform modeling of sub-basins and channels, determine the design discharge. Obviously, this part here is a bit complicated compared to the rational formula. And of course, it will require also more input data. Okay, this is how we estimate using design uh, discharge, but uh, rather a specific discharge method. The basic assumption is that, again, I, I would like to repeat that the basic assumption here is that drainage basin in the same region behave similarly. So this is how the design or specific discharge is obtained. Good. Now, you have here the capital Q. You just multiply the area of the catchment by the specific discharge. And how to obtain the specific discharge, this is the formula where the value of C depends on where is that region. If you are in Luzon, Visayas, or Mindanao, and also it depends on the return period, two year, five year, up to 100 year return period. It's provided in the manual. See that uh, once you have the specific discharge, you now multiply it by the area once again, and I repeat, you are able to get a design discharge. DPWH in the manual is also providing this graph so that you can obtain readily the specific discharge. What you need to do is simply have the catchment area, then here you have the specific discharge. And the graph, uh, the red graph is for the Visayas region, the, the blue one, uh, the upper one is for Luzon and for Mindanao you have the, the lower part. Okay. Now, the calculation of peak runoff, 
using the rational method. Now take note, the method is allowed only up to 20 square kilometer of area. Well, the, the formula is CIA. And you, if you are using the system international, that's cubic meters per second, and rainfall intensity in mm per hour, the area is in hectares, then you need to divide the CIA by 360 so that you come up with a unit cubic meters per second for the discharge. And these are the things needed. You need to delineate the catchment area. So the map mentioned earlier, one is to 50,000 scale, can, you, can be used for this purpose. Then you have to estimate the time of concentration. EPWH recommended the Kerpik formula, but there are several formulas for the uh, time of concentration. Then based on the time of concentration, using also the RIDF, you can now obtain the rainfall intensity to be used. Now, let me show you uh, this situation. This is the IDF of Mactan Cebu. Uh, so we published two year up to 100 year return period. So this is the shortest return period. And here is the longest return period, 100 year return period for rainfall. And we just say that when you calculated the time of concentration, okay, the value is 60 minutes. So you locate it here. And suppose you are designing uh, for 10 year return period, then you, you look at the green line. Therefore, the rainfall intensity to be used is 68 mm per hour. But I would like to emphasize that a real rainfall event cannot occur uniformly for one hour with a value of 68 mm per hour. So instead of just utilizing one value, if the return period or if the time of concentra concentration is longer, relatively longer, I would suggest to divide this into interval probably of 15 minutes and then you also divide the area using isochrones. This is what I'm trying to, to say. This is the entire catchment area. And instead of just using one rainfall intensity, which is good for one hour, I would like to divide it into interval of 15 minutes. So this is the lowest intensity for the 15 minute period. This one is the highest here. Then we arrange, we arrange the hiatograph in alternating block. Uh, there are several rainfall patterns. A rainfall pattern like from high, from low to high is possible. From high to low, it's also possible. But this one will capture more or less the typical rainfall pattern. So we divide the catchment into sub areas where you have here an isochrone. The meaning of isochrone is that it is a boundary that will delineate a sub-catchment that will contribute its water to the outlet at a given period of time. So for example, if that period of time is 15 minutes, then all this area will drain its water after 15 minutes to the outlet. And then another isochrone here, so this is now for the 30 minutes, meaning to say this particular region will now contribute the discharge after uh, 30 minutes. And if this is the rainfall pattern, then this is the discharge that you can obtain at the outlet. So for example, in the first 15 minutes, it is only this region that is contributing to the discharge. That's why you have there C1, area one, I1. But in the next 15 minutes, these two areas are now contributing 
but this one is contributing to the rainfall that has fallen now and this one will contribute to the rainfall that has fallen 15 minutes ago that's why you have this calculation and so on as a consequence of that you are able to formulate what we call hydrograph no? hydrograph so here i'm using rainfall patterns so this is one pattern like that and this is the corresponding hydrograph if you increase the rainfall say you are using now a higher return period then the hydrograph will also increase and then the another return period the hydrograph will also increase the return periods are placed here 10 25 and 100 year return period that is for cia no okay another way is by the flood frequency analysis this is a statistical method but then you will be needing long records of discharge data and uh, sometimes that's the problem no we don't have long records of discharge data though there are a lot of basins in luzon where we have long records already so for the flood, flood frequency analysis uh, I think uh, this will be for the future uh, uh, in our scenario, in our case, because DOST, if you can see the screen, DOST actually installed a lot of measuring devices already. Huh? Uh, if you can see the map, the blue one there is the automa automatic, uh, automatic uh, ring gauge. And then the they have also the water level recorder sensors uh, distributed all over the Philippines. And this is just for the Visayas region. They claim that they, they have already 1,023 automatic gauges, then 261 automatic stations, uh, 539 uh, water level monitoring, and 182 combination of water level and rain gauges. Uh, once we have this data, then probably we can already apply this flood frequency analysis. Now, how, how do we do flood frequency analysis? Say there are n years of maximum, in years of maximum daily discharge data. Take note, it's maximum daily discharge data. For example, if you have 20 or 30 years of record, for every year, you have to process 365 maximum floods, no? uh, maximum daily discharge data. So every day, you have a value of discharge. Then you get the maximum of the 365. That is one data point. No? That's for one year. So we call it as the maximum daily annual Okay. Make sure that the data has no trend and jump, meaning the data should be consistent. Rank the data from highest with rank 1 and lowest with rank N. Plot the data using the plotting position. There are several plotting positions. The one recommended by DPWH is the Weibull plotting position. Then fit a reasonable probability distributions. Now the P is what we call as the probability of exceedance. That is the probability that a particular event is being exceeded, being exceeded or equaled, no? being equaled or exceeded. Then the reciprocal of that is what we call the return period or recurrence interval. The common probability distributions to describe flood, there are several of them, but uh, extreme value the fam extreme value family, the extreme value type 1, extreme value type 2, extreme value type 3. The type 1 is what we call as the gamble distribution. The log normal is also a promising probability density function. I will show you the, the probability density function for the gamble. Uh, don't be afraid of this. Because <laughs> you can do that automatically actually, but that is the form of the extreme value type one or the Gumbel 
distribution where x is the value of the flood and these are the parameters of the distribution. The log normal on the other hand has this form. This is the log normal distribution. Okay. I will show you, uh, I processed several rivers in Luzon. I fitted uh, flood distributions or this probability distributions. And this is one example. The length of record is 27 years. Then the, the blue dots there are the data. And the red curve, that is now the Gumbel distribution fitted to the data. You will agree with me that the Gumbel distribution captures no? most of the data, except probably this portion here, where you have so about two that are far from the rest. And you notice that there's another one here. Well, that particular event may be, uh, it is caused by some special uh, factors. And I would suspect that that kind of flood belongs to a longer return period. But it occurred during that particular uh, duration of recording. Okay, this is the log normal. So the log normal, as you can see, does not really uh, capture the data nicely because it underestimates the, the floods with higher, uh, with longer return period. And in, it overestimates, as you can see in here, for the floods of um, uh, shorter return period. So that is frequency analysis. Now, using this frequency analysis, if you are contented with this, then you can now determine the flood level at any return period, as long as it is within, no? it is within the number of years of record. Now, if you want to extrapolate, please do it with care. No? Do not just extrapolate without really uh, analyzing things. The flood hazard maps. Uh, let me show you now some flood hazard maps. And before I'll do that, uh, I'll, I'll explain uh, how did these flood hazard maps were, were developed. The Philippines has a project and we call it the Phil LIDAR program. No? It is supported by the Department of Science and Technology and the purpose of which is to produce flood hazard maps for over 300 river basins in the Philippines. The lead university is UP, University of the Philippines in Diliman, but they collaborated with the 14 state universities and colleges and higher education institutions. Okay, these are the list of these uh, state universities and higher institutions, Ateneo de Naga University, Ateneo de Sambuanga, Caraga State, Central uh, State University, Central Mindanao University, Isabela State University, Mapua Institute of Technology, Mindanao State University, Iligan Institute of Technology, University of the Philippines, Baguio, University of the Philippines in Cebu, University of the Philippines Los Banos, University of the Philippines Mindanao, University of San Carlos, and Visaya State University. So these are the three universities uh, in the Visayas involved in that project. Okay, the what is used there is uh, the lidar technology, no? and uh, when we see lidar, it is like light detection and ranging. So it is an active remote sensing technology that measures distance based on the reflected laser light. Okay, so to obtain information, uh, somebody has to fly. <laughs> In this case, UP is using an airplane and the, 
the distance from the airplane to the ground is measured by this formula. No? Distance is simply the speed of light times t over 2. And obviously, you can define the topography by simply subtracting the different distances. So for example here, this distance is smaller compared to this distance. So if you subtract them, then you can get the difference in levels. So that's uh, the principle uh, behind this LiDAR technology. Now take note, uh, for airborne LiDAR system measures a rate of 100,000 to 500,000 points per second. Very fast. Now for small scale, uh, you can also use drone. No? Okay, these are the gadgets that you have to place uh, in the airplane to take pictures. And once uh, you have the pictures, then the different uh, collaborating universities will process to their respective assignments. University of San Carlos is in charge of Region 7. Okay, of course you need uh, powerful softwares uh, or sophisticated softwares and powerful computers to process the images to convert it into a usable information. And that usable information is in terms of uh, digital terrain model and digital uh, DEM, elevation model. Okay, uh, so this is the LiDAR office in the University of San Carlos during the implementation of the project. So this is an example of uh, digital elevation model uh, for the now. So this is provided by engineer uh, Aurif Loraya. So you can see the, the color that represents elevation. So here is another one. Uh, this is actually the Nasipit area. It is used by my student uh, because he evaluated the effectiveness of retention basins to reduce flood volume and flood peaks that will discharge to the uh, certain place in Mandawi City. Okay, so this is another example of DEM. So you can see here the, the color. So this one represents high elevation and uh, the blue one represents low elevation. Okay, uh, the project is using the HEC HMS and also HEC RAS, HEC GEO HMS and GIS softwares to make uh, these hazard maps. But this is actually the HEC HMS representation of the catchment. Uh, you have the, the overland flow, subsurface flow, seepage, and that will become runoff. Okay, so these are the activities performed in coming up with the flood hazard maps. Number one, digital elevation model obtained using LIDAR. So the information is you can go up to one meter by one meter resolution, meaning for every one meter square, you have a, an information to delineate the catchment boundaries and determine uh, determination of water waste. So instead of using the one is to 550,000 maps, if we can use the digital elevation model as a result of LIDAR, then we can have a more uh, refined, uh, more accurate de delineation of catchment area. Number two, rainfall and corresponding hydrographs were obtained by actual measurements. This is in collaboration with the Department of Science and Technology. So additional automatic rain gauges or ARG were installed. So the nice thing about ARG is that you are just sitting in your office and you can have the data, no? Because it will be sent uh, by the instrument. We have also the automatic uh, water level sensors. There are several of them already installed in major rivers. The actual river cross-sections were measured by surveying and then the river stages corresponding flow rates will also measured to come up with what we call rating curves. 
river bathymetry was performed to map the riverbed topography because the LIDAR could not penetrate the water surface. So you need to have bathymetry survey to describe the topography under the water. Number five, land use map were obtained using satellite images and ground truth uh, surveys. Soil maps published by Geoscience Bureau of the Department of Environment, natural resources were used. Rainfall intensity, duration, frequency, curves of Pagasa were used to simulate the floods that correspond to specified return periods. The hiatographs were arranged in alternating block method. Then we compare the result of the simulation with historical events. So the software used, HEC HMS, HEC GU, HMS, GIS, also the HECRAS, just for the modeling no, aspect. Now, I, I would like to warn the participants uh, for the rest or for the succeeding uh, flood hazard maps. So here's a warning here, be careful in interpreting these maps. So I would say only qualified persons must do the interpretation or wrong decisions might be made. No? So sample of flood hazard maps. Uh, this is for uh, Talisay, I think Talisay, uh, Mananga, no? because Mananga is one of the rivers identified in the project. This is the five year flood. Now the color represents the depth of water. The yellow one is between 0.21 to 0.50. And the purple is two to five meters. So this is the main river, the Manang River. So you can see the color there. So the depth is between two to five meters. That is for the five year flood. So this portion here, as you can, as you can see, we have really a flooded portion also. Uh, 25 year flood, the, the same, more or less the same flooded region, but the depth increases already. Uh, so if you go back to the five year, and this is now the, the 25, and this is the 100 year uh, return period. So you can see the color here has changed. So the, the depth there has, has, has increased. Okay, there's another one, the flood hazard map in the vicinity of Kutkut uh, River. So the same interpretation, the color represents depth. Uh, that is the five year flood. And this is the 25 year. And uh, this is the 100 year. So uh, LIDAR or Phil LIDAR has this flood hazard maps already. Okay, uh, I will now talk about frequent flooding in urbanized areas and then factors and possible mitigation. No? Uh, urbanized that, that includes Cebu. Now look at Cebu in 1985, Metro Cebu, no? that extends uh, Liluan up to Talisay. That's the Google Earth Pro image. I want you to appreciate the amount of urbanization. So this is now the new image. Again, let's go back to the previous one. And this is the, the image in 2016. You can see a lot of things happening. You can see the SRP already, no? this, this region here, SRP. Another view, okay, this is in 1984, 1984, I want you to notice that in 1984, the urbanized region is, uh, the urbanized portion is along the coast. But now, look at the level of urbanization. And what is the effect of this? Okay, 50 years ago, only the lower part of Metro Cebu, that's along the coast, was urbanized. The, hill, the hillsides, mountain tops, were used for small scale farming just for day to day subsistence. There were wide open spaces and paved ground surfaces, the condition favorable for water infiltration. 
there were no floods then, even for rainfall of magnitudes that could cause already one meter deep flooding on roads at downtown Cebu nowadays. In the past, uh, uh, a question is why do we have narrow creeks? Because I probably our neighboring cities and towns can learn on this. No, why do we have narrow creeks in Cebu? As mentioned in the past, the undeveloped areas of Metro Cebu could absorb most of the rainwater, so only a small fraction of it became surface runoff. Thus, no floods were experienced except for very extreme events. So personally, I believe that such experience somehow influenced the planners and policy implementers during that time to wrongfully embrace the impression that narrow creeks and channels were sufficient to drain the place and nothing could go wrong if the 30 meter easement requirement for rivers as provided in the water code of the Philippines is not strictly implemented. So you can see narrow creeks. Huh? So this is a flooding uh, in SM. Uh, it happened in July 27, 2015. Then we tried to evaluate uh, because this is caused by the overflowing of the Mahiga Creek. So in the Mahiga Creek, we, uh, Auri and I model this. Uh, the area is only 17.7 .7 square kilometers. Uh, and we assume that uh, a scenario where there's, the area is not yet urbanized to the present, and then this is the result. As you can see, the hydrograph uh, will give us the past value of Q peak 171.8, and at the present scenario, we have 214. So that's an increase of 25%. And if the rivers could not accommodate that, then the water will go to the streets instead of uh, using the river. No more space for the river. So another example, this is in AS Fortuna, uh, July 1 and July 2. That's the flooding in AS Fortuna. We don't experience this kind of flood in that area before. Now let's look at the rain that causes it. When I look at the rainfall data, uh, the rain in, in July 1 is a total of 113 millimeters. That's July 1. The maximum 15 minute rainfall is 124 mm per hour. The maximum 30 minute is 101 mm per hour, while the one hour uh, rainfall is 98 mm per hour. If you are going to plug in that value to the IDF. The IDF, uh, actually I used the data in the Lahog airport before and tried to formulate an intensity duration frequency curve. So if you look at, for example, this particular event where the maximum one hour intensity is 98 mm, then that could be in one hour and 98, uh, it is somewhere here, here. So that's, uh, that's equivalent to, uh, it's even less than the 30 minute uh, return, uh, the, the, 30 mi the 30 year return period. So I, I don't expect that kind of flood that, of that magnitude before. Now we have, for example, another example is the Paknaan, no? the, the flooding in October 4. So fortunately, I, I got this picture in the internet so CDN, uh, according to the reporter uh, here, the flood level is up to the waist level. Okay, maybe a, a, a bit less. No? <laughs> and this is the area uh, during that uh, particular time also, October 4. Uh, October 4. But if you look at the rainfall events, there's a recorder in Kabangkalan, Kanduman, Mandawe. So this is the rainfall in October 2. Now, much bigger in, in October 7. That's the rainfall and that's not very uh, high rainfall, no? 
compared to the the previous rainfalls that we experienced before. So this is another view. This is the cumulative. So cumulative meaning in October two, uh, two the total depth is only thirty, and here the total depth is forty nine. Uh, this is the rain recorded in DOST Region Seven in Sudlon Lahog. Uh, October two, the bigger forty nine mm. This is the cumulative for the same station. And these are the rainfall events. Uh, see, in 1982, we even experienced a higher, a very high rainfall total, 171. Uh, I experienced this uh, event. There was a flooding on the street in front of uh, Country Mall, Gaisano Country Mall already during that time. But we have really high intensity rain that does not cause flooding that we experience nowadays. I will show you example of flood mitigation. Uh, this is the Nasipit catchment. Now, this is the area where it's flooded, no? easily flooded. And this is a more accurate catchment delineation. This is now based on the LIDAR DEM a courtesy of my master student. So this region here, uh, before, uh, before 2009, the flood level there could reach up to 0.8 meters no, for a moderate uh, rainfall events. But nowadays, uh, you can still experience flooding there, there but only up to 0.3, highest, no? 0.1 to 0.3 meters. What happened? The catchment area that is contributing water there, there are several retention ponds. So if I'll go back to this diagram, this is the retention pond of MCWD. We have a retention pond here of US, uh, University of San Carlos. There are actually two. We designed for three, we constructed for three, but the functional is only two because the other one is causing problems to some residents. So they have to destroy it. And then inside the university, we have also some uh, retention ponds. So the reduction of the flood on the street is due to this retention ponds. So retention pond number one, University of San Carlos. Retention pond number two, also University of San Carlos. This is the MCWD pond. No? You can see it can store a lot of water. And right now, MCWD is planning to add another pond uh, near to this site. So probably that could reduce further the flooding. Now, detention ponds inside the University of San Carlos. Uh, this is the detention pond. Okay, And the soccer field is used also as a temporary detention basin. So it can uh, restore, uh, it can store temporarily huge amount of water. So that is the appearance of the soccer field of the university when there is downpour. Okay, I guess uh, that's, that's all that I can share to you. And after this, uh, nature gives us valuable lessons. Let us learn and apply them. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay.